Welcome to today's IWCS webinar. My name is Connie, and I will be your WebEx producer for today's event. And now I'm pleased to turn the webinar over to Ed Fenton, your IWCS moderator. Ed, please go ahead. Thank you, Connie. Our IWCS webinar series event is hosted by the International Cable and Connectivity Symposium. I am Ed Fenton, a cable industry advisor working with the IWCS team. As Connie said, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box on the bottom right of your screen to post a question anonymously at any point during the presentation. If you wish to contact the presenter or IWCS after the presentation, you will be given the contact points at the end of the webinar. Please note that IWCS does not distribute the presentation slides from either our conference sessions or these webinars. However, please feel free to contact the presenter directly and they will respond individually to you. Today, we welcome Jeff Hendrick, Product Manager for US Connect, North Carolina, USA, who will be presenting his paper on increasing duplex connector density while maintaining user accessibility. Jeff Hendrick is a Product Manager at US Connect Limited he has over 19 years of technical and commercial experience in the fiber optic industry. He is co-inventor on two patents. He received a BS of electrical engineering from North Carolina State University. Jeff, we welcome you to present at today's IWCS webinar series event. Thank you, Ed. Good morning, my name is Jeff Hendrick, and I am the Single Fiber Connector Product Manager at US Connect in Hickory, North Carolina. And today we're going to discuss increasing duplex connect connector density while maintaining user accessibility. The co-authors of this presentation are Mike Hughes, Vice President of Product Management, and Jason Higley, Manager of Connector Development. Today we want to discuss why a new, smaller optical connector format is needed, the connector or the challenges associated with creating a smaller form factor optical connector and how the challenges led to a final solution that will still meet the strenuous telecom industry standard requirements. Cell phones, tablets, laptops, Xbox, Netflix, YouTube, 5G, IoT, and we cannot forget about Alexa and Siri. All of these items love bandwidth and require more bandwidth each and every day to provide us with the service level we have come to expect. Roku released a 2019 cord cutting study where it is estimating that over the next five years, almost 60 million U.S. homes will access television programming via streaming. Why is this important? If so, it would be the first time streamers would surpass traditional pay TV viewers. Why is this more important to us? because streaming utilizes much more bandwidth than traditional cable TV broadcasts. Per the Cisco Visual Networking Index, a cord-cutting household generates 72% higher traffic than an average household. This difference is due to cable TV video is broadcast to multiple users at once, while streaming content is directed at individual users. All of this bandwidth generates an enormous amount of Internet growth. According to the Cisco Visual Networking Index, IP traffic is expected to grow to 396 exabytes per month by 2022, up from 122 exabytes per month in 2017, a CAGR of 26%. Of that total, IP video traffic will account for 82% of the traffic in 2022. But it's not just the quantity of users, it's also the quality. So let's think about video, for instance. Ultra high definition video rate, 4K video, the bit rate for it is more than two times high definition video bit rate and more than nine times standard definition video bit rate. As the quantity and quality of the internet content increases, this leads to an ever increasing transceiver speeds and a constantly growing number of fibers to manage. These two charts simply show the variety of optical transceivers in the Internet space on the left and their composite quantities on the right as a portion of all optical transceivers. As you can see, the quantity of transceivers along with parallel optic transceivers continues to increase over the next five years. 
This means that data centers will continue to grow in number and in size to continue to accommodate this additional growth of transceivers and optical fibers. Bandwidth and IP traffic are increasing, and this is driving data center speeds and growth. But what's really driving the need for a new optical connector? The optical communications industry has many different optical connectors for all types of applications. Multi-fiber optical connectors, such as the MPO connector, provide the highest fiber density and are used for most trunk or bulk connectorization applications. Panel or module capacity using MPO connectors can easily go over 800 fibers per one rack unit. But as you'll notice in the chart, you'll see that MPO is missing the ability for duplex level granularity. LC connectors allow for simplex or duplex optical connectivity, which is important to individualize communication links. The maximum panel or module capacity using duplex LC connectors is approximately 144 fibers per one rack unit. This limitation is simply due to the connector package size of the LC duplex connector. A new very small form factor connector would increase the panel module density by 3x, which reduces the overall amount of optical hardware needed, saving not only hardware cost, but also real estate cost, while at the same time allowing access to one duplex link. Passive optical hardware density is not the only reason a new optical connector format is needed. Several emerging optical transceiver formats are promoting breakout applications to split the bandwidth of higher speed transceivers among several lower speed transceivers. This can be used to partially upgrade the speed of essential links now and allow for speed upgrades of non-essential links at a later time. For example, a data center can use one 400G transceiver that would communicate with four separate 100G transceivers using a breakout configuration. Currently, this is performed using breakout cable assemblies or breakout modules. These cable assemblies or modules have an MTP connector on one side and LC duplex connectors on the other. These methods have been used for years and provide a very structured architecture that allows for ease of configurability and flexibility over the life of the system. A very small form factor connector would allow direct connection from one transceiver to multiple transceivers using two fiber optical cable assemblies instead of breakout cable assemblies or breakout modules. For certain installations with simplified cable layouts, this method may be preferred because it minimizes hardware cost and real estate needs for passive optical hardware. A very small form factor connector would fill the gap between an LC duplex connector and the MPO connector regarding density and the ability to access duplex links. It can also provide a unique breakout solution for certain installations that could reduce overall spend. So to recap our current limitations, the most common optical connector for duplex connectivity is the LC duplex connector. The status quo for breakouts is to use the breakout cables or modules that have the MPO connector on one end and an LC duplex connector on the other. Emerging transceiver applications can support up to four duplex links. However, LC duplex connectors can only provide up to one duplex link. We now understand the need for a very small form factor connector. Now we need to understand what elements should be considered and what should be required when developing a very small form factor connector. Based on our conversation so far, I think everyone would agree that a new optical connector format must have a reduced size relative to the LC duplex connector. We will review the QSFP-DD and SFP-DD requirements for breakout applications to assist with targeting this size. While not necessarily a requirement, we believe for a new optical con connector to be readily accepted by most cable systems makers, the adapter should be backwards compatible with current hardware. Most installers already think an LC connector is a small connector. Unique design features will, need, will be needed to allow each optical connector to be accessed individually without tools. Since we are dealing with a two-fiber cable, the ability to reverse polarity is a necessity. System design is not always as expected, and the ability to change polarity 
without reordering, reordering cable assemblies is a plus. Last, but probably the most important, a very small form factor connector should work for all optical applications, multi-mode, single mode, and APC, and should meet the same industry standard qualification requirements as the LC duplex connectors. If we review the QSFP DD specification, you will notice that there are provisions for 12 fibers, 16 fibers, and 24 fibers using MPO connectors. Therefore, in this, in this specification, density is already covered by the current connectors. However, the MPO connectors do not allow you to separate into duplex links at the transceiver. This is where duplex LC connectors provide the access to the individual duplex links. However, the physical size of the duplex LC connector will not allow for the 4 to 1 breakout for QSFPDD or a 2 to 1 breakout for the SFPDD format. Therefore, the size of the QSFPDD and SFPDD formats in combination with breakout applications will be used to help target the necessary size for the very small form factor connector. So let's review the QSFPDD format first. The overall size of the optical connector interface area is 19 millimeters wide by 13.5 millimeters high. Dividing this area by four based on the four to one breakout application, provides an individual connector area of 4.75 millimeters wide by 13.5 millimeters tall. Similarly, using the SFPDD format, the overall size of the optical connector interface area is 14 millimeters wide by 12.05 millimeters high. Dividing this area by two based on the two to one breakout application provides an individual connection area of seven millimeters wide by 12.05 millimeters high. So designing a connector that would work for these two applications means a connector must be smaller than 4.75 millimeters by 12.05 millimeters at the connection interface area. If we were only designing for the new breakout applications, we would have our maximum size limits. However, we also believe it's highly important to provide backwards compatibility to existing modules and panels to minimize additional hardware development expenses for the hardware manufacturers. We chose to start with the LC duplex cutout since the LC duplex connectors are prominent in the optical industry and are standard in data center designs. The TIA specification allows for a 13 millimeter wide by 9.5 five millimeter cutout for an LC duplex adapter. From our QSFPDD spec, two 4.75 millimeter wide connectors would easily fit within the LC duplex cutout. However, if we reduce the width slightly to 4.3 millimeters, this would allow for three very small form factor connectors to fit into that same LC duplex cutout, essentially increasing the density by another 50%. The actual width and height of our final MDC connector is 3.7 millimeters wide by 8.9 millimeters tall. The further reduction in size is attributed to the space needed for the vertical and horizontal walls and the supports in the adapter to meet the performance requirements we will discuss later. Shrinking connector size is good for density, but boy, it's not good for individual connector accessibility. Since the average fingertip size is 1.6 to 2 centimeters wide, connectors that are five times smaller in width are going to be difficult to remove, especially with a thumb latch mechanism. Some current connectors, like LC duplex connectors, use a push-pull stick or tab to move the finger access point away from the connectors and cables to provide better accessibility. However, increasing connector density by a factor of three reduces the amount of free space, even around the tabs and the cables. The push-pull functionality really needs to move to another component of the connector. Moving the push-pull functionality to the boot allows you to remove the push-pull tabs completely, providing more area for finger access. Boot design is more important because previously boots were designed to simply maintain bend radius. Now the boot must have an axial stiffness to overcome the spring force of approximately 10 newtons during insertion, yet maintain flexibility for bending and durability testing. 
In fact, due to the tight spacing, it is very important that adjacent boots flex left and right to allow fingers to fit around the desired boot. Here is a quick video that shows the functionality of the, the push-pull boot. And I believe Connie's going to help us get the file to load. shows how the boot is used to access the individual connectors and also shows us the method for polarity reversal, which is, which is what we will discuss next. We could spend hours on polarity alone. Most communication systems use two fibers for communication, one fiber to transmit from transceiver 1 to transceiver 2 and another fiber to transmit from transceiver 2 to transceiver 1. This is relatively simple for a point-to-point -point duplex link using a two-fiber cable assembly. However, when the two-fiber cable assemblies are connected through existing cable plant, patch panels, modules, and other two-fiber cables, the polarity can become reversed rather easily. Polarity is affected by the cable assembly type. Is it an A to A cable or an A to B cable? Adapter keying, is it key up to key up or key up to key down? and orientation of the fibers relative to the connector key. To alleviate this concern for an end customer who may or may not know how the system is configured, adding the ability to reverse polarity at the connector level is essential. There are many methods to provide polarity reversal, but we chose a removable latch mechanism that can attach to either side of the connector housing. The removable latch allows for quick and easy reversal and at the same time does not open the connector housing, exposing fibers at any point during the polarity reversal process. Three polarity indicators are also included, which provides immediate indication of the polarity of the connector. Working with a smaller connector format reduces the total amount of material that would help to distribute forces applied to it. Connector design becomes extremely important to limit the amount of movement seen by the ferrules during mechanical tests, which in turn will minimize optical insertion loss. One area of design focus was connector engagement length, along with the geometrical design of the connector and adapter interface, providing a long engagement length in both the X and Y axes limits the amount of angular rotation the connector can experience relative to the adapter in either axis. As you can see by the chart, when we maintain similar tolerancing of the connector and adapter fit, lengthening the engagement length drastically reduces the amount of rotation, which in turn limits the amount of insertion loss increase. To further limit feral movement, a concept called feral float was added as a design component. Ferrule float simply means the connector housing is designed to allow the ferrules to rotate relative to the connector at a larger angle than the connector can rotate relative to the adapter. This allows the connector to rotate due to the strenuous mechanical forces within the confines of the adapter without translating those forces directly to the ferrules. By doing so, optical signal loss is not increased even though connector housing may be under stress and may rotate slightly. One of the most important steps in designing any new connector format is to ensure the new connector will meet the demanding requirements of industry standard tests. One of the most demanding tests in the optical industry is the Telcordia GR326 test program for optical connectors. This program is designed to ensure the connector remains properly seated in the adapter and that the connectors remain properly attached to the cable during forces such as flexing, twisting, pulling, and durability. To verify our design assumptions, we have run several tests to the GR326 requirements on the very small form factor MDC connector using both 1.6 millimeter and 2.0 millimeter two fiber cables. 
Two of the more severe tests, proof and twall, are listed here. As you can see, for all loads and angles of load application, the connector design easily meets the insertion loss requirements. If we compare the very small form factor MDC connector with the other connectors common to the data center space, you will notice that for extreme density, the MPO connector will always provide the highest fiber density due to having multiple fibers per ferrule. The very small form factor MDC connector closes the gap on fiber density uh, over the LC duplex connector while allowing access to duplex links. Breakout applications can still be performed using MPO connectors. However, it does require more expensive breakout cables and or breakout hardware. Breakout applications using a very small form factor connector can be performed using two fiber cable assemblies. So in conclusion, we do feel there is a need in the optical industry for a very small form factor connector that can increase optical fiber density and still provide access to duplex level connectivity. To achieve this goal, we had to determine requirements of emerging applications, connector mechanics, and human interfaces with the optical systems. The MDC connector will provide fiber density up to 432 fibers in one rack unit, which is three times the um, LC duplex connector density while the push-pull boot will allow access to duplex links and providing polarity reconfiguration. Most importantly, even though it is a smaller optical connector format, the connector is designed for all optical applications, multi-mode, single-mode, and APC, and will meet the same telecom industry standard requirements as the LC Uniboot connector. The reduced connector footprint will allow data center managers the option to redesign their optical systems to reduce optical hardware footprint, which in turn will reduce capital and operational expenses. Thank you, and I'll turn this back over to Ed. And thank you, Jeff. Uh, at this time, we will take as many questions from the attendees as time permits, starting with this first question. Uh, is the primary application of these high-density fibers and connectors in data centers? Are there other applications? Uh, there are definitely other applications. Um, in fact, when we first looked at this connector, we were looking at it more towards uh, the transceiver applications or the breakout applications. Um, but what we have found out is uh, there are many more applications for higher density uh, duplex level connectivity uh, applications. So uh, there are data center applications, there are MSO applications, um, there are uh, even LAN applications where someone's just trying to get uh, higher numbers of duplex connectors in one, in one location. Okay, thank you. Um, Next, how difficult is the field maintenance or connector replacement in these high-density applications? Repeat that one more time, please. Sure. How difficult is the field maintenance or connector replacement in these high-density applications? Uh, I would say it would be about the same as what the LC duplex connector would be right now. Um, as you can see, or as we've shown in the slides, uh, what uh, would be the largest issue is probably finger access. Uh, and by being able to use the uh, push-pull boots instead of reaching all the way in, you will be able to pull out one connector and be able to change that connector if needed. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any modifications to the transceivers required to accommodate these MDC connectors? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, there are. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, most transceivers right now have either an MPO connector or an LC duplex connector. What you will see coming out uh, over the next year or so is more transceivers that will have the very small form factor uh, receptacle in them for those applications. So there is a totally different transceiver based on having that different receptacle. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, 
what is the material used for the boot? In general, it's a polypropylene, um, and that's probably all I can say. <laughs> okay, very good. Enough said. Um, at this point, I am seeing no further questions. So I would like to thank you, Jeff, for presenting this very interesting and important topic today. Please note the contact points being shown should you wish to contact Jeff after today's event. Each of these IWCS webinar series presentation events are recorded and will be archived on the IWCS.org website. It normally takes up to two weeks for these to be posted. The IWCS webinar series will conduct presentation events on a monthly basis. Webinar events will take place on the third Friday of each month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Our next scheduled webinar event will be on Friday, June 19th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern USA time. Each of you will be receiving an announcement for the event a few weeks prior. Please feel free to share our announcements with your colleagues so they can join in and register as well. For over 68 years, the IWCS International Cable Connectivity Symposium has been the recognized leader showcasing new technologies in cable and connectivity processes, products, and applications. Our next 69th annual international conference will now take place virtually in October 2020. Please watch your inbox, social media, and our website as this exciting information becomes available. Also, the next UL and IWCS China Cable and Connectivity Symposium will take place on Tuesday, March 23rd through Thursday, March 25th, 2021 at the Marriott Hotel City Center in Shanghai, China. Please visit our website at iwcs.org for more event details. In just a moment, you will see a brief survey so that you can provide us your feedback and comments on today's event so that we can further improve this webinar series for you. Thank you for participating, and this concludes today's event.